When we hear economists and politicians talk about the key driver of high house prices in Toronto, one narrative tends to dominate the media headlines. And that is that the primary cause for high home prices is a lack of supply due to government regulations or nimbyism. And many of the advocates of this housing supply narrative argue that if governments simply changed zoning policies to allow more homes to be built in existing neighborhoods, builders would flood the market with new homes, which in turn would help to drive down house prices and rents, leading to a more affordable housing market. But how realistic are the supply side solutions we keep hearing about? Today, I'm going to be talking to Cameron Murray, who's an Australian economist at the University of Sydney, well known for challenging the housing supply narratives that also dominate the debate about high house prices in Australia, where he's based. I talked to Cameron about why he's not convinced that a lack of supply caused by local planning constraints is the key driver of high house prices in Australia. We discussed why he supports policies that lead to more housing density, but doesn't think they'll do much to make homes actually more affordable. And finally, Cameron discussed how Singapore helps keep housing affordable by having their government actually take a more nonprofit approach to building homes that are intended to be bought and occupied by citizens. Uh, I hope you find this video helpful. If you have any questions about it, please send me an email at askjohn at movesmartly.com. And now onto our episode. All right, Cameron, thanks so much for joining me today on our Move Smartly podcast YouTube channel to chat a little bit about housing markets in Australia, housing markets uh, in Canada. And I, and I thought we'd kick off with Australia, obviously, which is where you're based. Uh, because, I mean, Canada and Australia seem to have very similar things going on. You know, housing market that, that's booming, prices are, are kind of surging. They didn't really um, crash during the U.S. financial crisis the way the U.S. did. And, and, and we hear a lot of similar stories about, you know, foreign capital and supply and all of these things. So maybe, uh, and I know you've actually written kind of arguing against, you know, this, this idea that the problem in Australia is, is a lack of housing. So maybe you can kind of maybe start off by walking through how, you know, you came up with that idea or that analysis or that conclusion, and then maybe some of the other things that you think might be driving kind of the Australian market. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the Australian market and the Canadian market are seeing very similar trends at the moment. Um, I, th um, I guess uh, at a broad level, I would say that a lot of markets globally synced up during COVID. Um, because most central banks lowered their cash rates. So mortgages became cheap all of a sudden. And as I like to say, um, you can get a house by renting it from a landlord or renting money from a bank and being your own landlord. And so the cost of renting money and becoming your own landlord collapsed um, just about globally for two years. And so we saw the whole sort of world sync up on this boom cycle uh australia and the and canada likewise so for example i live in brisbane and prices went up 45 percent in in 18 months from mid 2020 wow. to earlier this year um and in sydney i think it was you know high 20 percent um so so that's essentially the situation um what we also saw and i think um to sort of relate to the supply story a little bit. Uh, we also saw rents fall quite a lot. So actually in Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne, we saw rents falling from 2017 all the way through 20, mid-2020 oh, wow. during COVID. Yeah. Um, so we had a massive construction boom uh, in the mid-2010s, especially apartments in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and that really, you know, did take the pressure off things. And that, that, construction boom was was in the doldrums um, mm -hmm. by 2019 actually mm -hmm. um, because rents had fallen everyone had stopped building um, so so I do find it quite interesting that um, you know related to what's going on in Canada this whole supply story we had a similar debate here in 2017 to 2019 while rents were falling in our biggest cities that, that were, were, there wasn't enough supply um, which was very puzzling. But what we've actually seen, uh, and this is, again, it's a common trend in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand in 2021, especially, is, is uh, 
a change in preferences would be what the economist would call it. People decided that the uh, value of the city location was lower now and the value of the regional location and the lifestyle was higher because we didn't have to commute to the office so much. So what we actually saw was gentrification of the regions. We saw high-income people displacing existing low-income people in lifestyle cities and regional towns. Um, And that is, I think, the biggest genuine social uh, effect in the last couple of years in the property market, uh, this displacement in regional towns, which is now partially reversing. And I think the other bit of context to keep in mind in the last couple of years is, and I'm not sure what it's like in Canada, and I, I should check the stats on this. We Australia actually saw increasing home ownership rates uh, in the last five years. So in 2016, we had the census and there was 65.4% home ownership. And in 2021, in August, we had 66.0. Now, it's not a big change, but 0.6% of all households is 60,000 households in Australia. And typically, that'd be about 150,000 people who'd shifted from renting to home owning during this period where we apparently had a home ownership crisis and all these real estate crises. We're actually, you know, rents were falling and home ownership was rising. Um, so it's a real, um, you know, lesson there that what happens in the press and the public debate doesn't have to be attached to the reality of the data at all. Yeah. It's just about feelings and emotions. <laughs> so that's sort of my round the grounds, big picture view of the key things that have been happening in the last few years, especially in Australia. That's awesome. I mean, it's, it's interesting because it, there definitely seems to be some differences. I mean, the home ownership rate here has been declining uh, over the past eight years from 69% to 67. Rents have been exploding, like they dipped a bit during COVID, but, you know, Toronto rents are up 26% year over year. Calgary, which should have a, a relatively elastic housing market, up like 18%. Um, you know, and, and I think this is where I wonder that, you know, are some of the dynamics different? I mean, at least, you know, at, at a high level in Canada, um, you know, our population has been growing, say, by three, 350,000 people like every year for the past 30 years. And, and with this new government, we're growing by like 600,000 now, but our housing completions have not changed, right? So, you know, yeah. is, is it, I guess, in this context with this basic information, you know, this, this idea that, okay, maybe we have some issue that our population's growing faster, you know, than our ability to build houses, right? Look, uh, I mean, I think you've got to keep in mind that everybody says this at every point in history uh, about the housing market. And what, what we often miss from this, this population versus housing debate Um, I'm not sure what the situation is in Canada. I'm just going to have a bit of a look um, at some some statistics if I can find some. But in Australia, I like to say we've got more bigger, better dwellings per capita than any point in history today. So supply is the problem. Supply has always been the problem. And it's now the least of um, it's been the least it's ever been a problem today. Um, we actually have had periods where dwelling completions were much lower than population growth. So um, for, for the Canadian listeners, you, you can take some lessons from Australia. So um, after the financial crisis, Australia's property market didn't do too badly in terms of price falls because we dropped interest rates a lot um, and we, we didn't quite have the panic that they had in the U.S., Um, But what we saw is uh, we saw massive immigration wave in that 2010 to 2013 period. Mm -hmm. And we had very low construction still because um, most of Australian housing construction is what I'd say is build to order. You don't build a house until you've sold it. And if, if sales are down and prices are down, then no one, you know, fewer people are buying at that price and therefore you build fewer homes. And so we actually had during that period a, a you know, huge excess of new population compared to housing. But what we also saw was that was the best period to buy a house. And that was the period when no one actually complained about the housing market because everything was low. We'd just come off this high. And so uh, even though those, you know, the physical 
aspects in terms of population and dwellings were the worst that ever been, everyone was happy. No one was complaining about it. Happy why? And then, because like it was happy because, because what? Re- Rents were stable, prices had fallen, but they'd stabilized and there was essentially flat. There was no massive boom. In fact, what we had is we had booms in Perth and mining towns at the time. Everyone was leaving the cities and going to the mining towns as well. So there were booms in certain places. Um, But everyone, I think, was just relieved. We didn't have a big crash and things were pretty stable. Um, But at the time, we had this massive immigration boom. Um, The other interesting uh, part about that is that you you see during that period that 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 happened because the average number of people per dwelling increased. Mm. Okay, so that's the, that's another margin on which people can adjust their behavior. Yeah, and so when you say rents are up twenty eight percent, you've got to think about the market as a whole and say what kind of crazy world are people who used to spend. of their income renting now spending 25% of their income and not consolidating. And, you know, one in every 20 households having one extra person in them to Mm -hmm. share that cost. Like, why does that not happen? Because that does happen. In fact, if you look at the data and what we've seen and part of the story of the COVID era is, is a reversal of that where people wanted to branch out on their own and renters became homeowners, mm. um, share houses dissolved into smaller groups. Um, so we actually saw a reversal of that. And I think it's also partly that people were willing to spend that extra percent of their income on rent because they're now using it as a home office. Mm-hmm. So you actually, um, you've sort of had this structural break on what a house is in the household budget it's now part house and part work and sometimes tax deductible business expense yeah um but i I suspect all that will reverse if we look at the us right now um you'll see that i think october had the first rental price falls for a couple of years and it was broadly you know across 80 percent of monitored cities rental price falls and i suspect just as easily as those households could separate, mm-hmm. they will consolidate again mm-hmm. with these high, slight, this elevated rents. And all of a sudden, you know, this happens every time, every housing cycle, all of a sudden there are houses everywhere and you can't sell them and you can't rent them. And what we used to think was a physical shortage all of mm-hmm. a sudden looks like you know, a physical glut just because it only takes one in 20 households to have one extra person and all of a sudden you've got 5% of the whole housing stock empty, Mm -hmm. right? Because you've got to think the stock only changes one to 2% per year, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a small change in the occupancy can unleash 5% of the total existing stock all of a sudden, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see a bit of that adjustment. I think that's happening in the US now. I think if if Toronto rents are so elevated, that's got to be happening now. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly the case in Australia that people are relocating back to the cities and essentially reforming their previous household structures. And I think I think we are seeing some of that consolidation. I mean, I think certainly, uh, you know, even in our bris, I mean, we, we don't brokerage and we're finding that you know, when, when we're listing homes for rent, like you're often getting two families trying to rent one house. Um, I mean, which is obviously driving up the number of people per uh, per housing unit because these are single family homes and somehow they're just uh, sharing them. Um, but I guess one question then is, you know, what is, if we're not underbuilding, what is the, the mechanism that would cause, like what would cause rents to surge 20 plus percent, you know what I mean, in a single year? Um, is it yeah, so really- a lot of that is, yeah. So I guess my view is it's predominantly household incomes, right? Um, the composition of incomes is is rising, and as a good long term rule of thumb, people spend roughly the same proportion of their income on housing um, mm-hmm. over time. So if 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 you know if, if incomes are up ten to fifteen percent in terms of household incomes, and people have a slight preference shift towards um, bigger homes or whatever the case may be, because now they can allocate a bit more of their budget to housing that they used to spend on, for example, commuting, mm-hmm. right? They're essentially saying, well, I'm, I'm saving you know, $100 a week 
commuting, so I'm going to spend a hundred dollars a week getting the, my preferred dwelling. Mm-hmm. Um, then that that sort of explains it pretty pretty easily. Um, just remember, you know, when rents if people can't afford the high rents, rents won't go up, right? They just they're not they're not just this magic thing that just goes up forever. Um, if, if people can't afford them, it, they won't be paid. So <laughs> I think that's also. <laughs> You know, uh, also important to keep in mind that, um, you know, there there is a limit here uh, on the market and, and it's generally in housing. It's the macroeconomic story here in terms of household incomes and the limit on growth. It's not a sort of isolated supply and demand story like we can think of for fruit and vegetables. I know it's popular in Australia to say houses are like bananas. You know, if we have lots of bananas, the price goes down. <laughs> I'm not sure what the equivalent is. Uh, if it's maple syrup or something in Canada, but um, that's the story we get. You know, if there's a sudden increase in in, in the, you know, it's a good season in bananas, prices fall. But the housing market is really a macroeconomic story. Um, you don't get, you know, good weather and a surprise increase in the stock of dwellings. Yeah. Whereas in bananas, if the weather's good, you've got heaps of bananas all of a sudden. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I mean, that's the story. It is, I mean, it is interesting because, of course, uh, I mean, incomes have not been rising too rapidly here, but certainly, uh, unlike house prices, for sure, rents are far more constrained by income. Like, obviously, house prices, you know, there are interest rates and other factors driving them. But uh, it, mm-hmm. it is interesting that the fact that we're seeing this rapid growth, because you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, if people can't afford it, they're not going to be paying it. Like, they're not going to have those, those units being rented. Um, yeah. So look, I just I just wrote something on my Substack today um, that that digs into this puzzle a bit because in Australia we had wages growth. Wage growth is three percent. So the price index of wages went up three percent. Household spending in the last twelve months went up twenty eight percent. How is it that if people are earning three percent more on for their wages that they're somehow spending twenty eight percent more? And of course, the answer to that is macroeconomics. The answer is that um, wages aren't income. Profits are somebody's income. So I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in Australia, we're having a mining profits boom. Well, everyone who owns shares of these mining companies is now getting a mining dividend income boom. In the US, you know, corporate taxes are... taxes in general are at record highs because of this income boom and it's not just wages it's mixed income so a lot of your contractors builders people who work for themselves in small business we call that mixed income in the national accounts i mean that was up 15 or something percent over the 12 months profits profits were up 25 percent uh in the last 12 months it's just that wages for the same job are not growing so much so you want to be careful Mm-hmm. saying household incomes haven't risen unless you're getting the complete picture of all the different ways households get incomes. And indeed, I'm not sure what the situation in Canada was like, but we had an, an enormous fiscal stimulus during COVID. Like mm-hmm. uh, people could withdraw 20000 out of their retirement accounts. Um, uh, uh, you know, people just got the, the, this cash splash of hundreds of billions of dollars. And it takes a while to spend that. Mm-hmm. 100%. So... I mean, one thing I was kind of curious about, if, if, if it's not housing supply in, in, in Australia, why do you think, because it seems like the politicians have a very similar narrative, and why do you think mm-hmm. there is this narrative that, that, you know, is being pushed that the solution, you know, to high home prices, for example, in Australia is just to build more homes, you know what I mean? Like, because you yeah. have a very similar narrative here. Well, I think we should probably talk about what supply means. Because um, I've been in this game a little while and I can tell you there's at least 25 different um, meanings that people use when they say supply. (laughs) So some say it's the physical stock of dwellings. Some say it's the change in the physical stock. Some say it's the amount advertised for sale. Some say it's, um, you know, the change in the amount advertised for sale. Some say it's the number of sales. So you've got to be clear that the market pricing is driven by sales and rental contracts that occur Mm -hmm. the physical stock almost none of the physical stock of dwellings Mm -hmm. right enters a enters a contract and has an effect on the price and if everybody who owned houses tried to sell them at once right even if the physical stock didn't change the price would fall right Mm -hmm. so you've got to separate out the physical 
stock of dwellings from the participation in exchange and trade of mm. not only the physical stock but the potential new stock as well. And now it's obviously true that if everybody tries to sell all at once and is flexible with what the price they'll accept, mm. given a fixed amount of demand, the prices will fall. Mm. Right? It's obviously true that we call that a property crash. <laughs> like we know that that happens, right? When everyone tries to sell all at once, that's called a property crash. Yeah. And that's how prices fall. So we know that that's true. What we don't know is true is that property owners who have undeveloped sites worth millions sitting on their balance sheets are prepared to panic sell or panic build at such a rate that rents collapse or prices collapse mm -hmm. in, their, in their market. That's what we don't have. And that's why houses aren't like bananas because you don't accidentally build 10,000 dwellings, right? You don't accidentally have good weather and double your harvest, right? Yeah. You sell, you build when you sell or close to it on average. Just like people don't accidentally build too many container ships. Whoops. Oh, you know, accidentally built too many. Now the price will collapse. No, we wait for someone to order it then we build it. That's yeah. what happens with large, expensive capital goods like ships and houses. So, um, so we've got to keep in mind that what, we're, what, what this supply story is saying at its heart is that with upzoning, we can trick property owners into crashing their own market. <laughs> that's, the, that's the core argument there, right? <laughs> That, and, and, and there's this weird economic logic behind it, you know, because econ economists can backfill a story for any politi politically palatable, you know, policy. Um, the, the story behind it is that there's this magical independent supply curve uh, where, where you will just keep building regardless. And, and I've got a paper called, you know, the housing absorption rate equation or something like that it's called. Uh, an academic paper and it goes into why it's not optimal for a property owner even if they've just been up zoned to flood the market with housing or set a price and sell it all at that price rather than take price rises when the market changes mm -hmm. and the short the short answer for that is that the logic of up zoning right is that when uh, there's some kind of optimal density at any given price Right. So because there's diseconomies of density, mm -hmm. the taller the building you build, the higher the marginal cost of going one extra story. That's why we don't just have everyone living in one tall building. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an optimal density. If you up, up zone, you allow people to go closer to that optimal density. But if there's an optimal density, isn't there also an optimal rate per period of time at which you would supply? Are we saying that property owners who can develop new housing a smart, they're smart enough to know that they want to build at the optimal density, but too dumb to know that there's an optimal rate per period that they should sell into the market to avoid suppressing prices. Because you don't want to sell too quickly so that your 10th dwelling, mm -hmm. you sell for less than your 9th, your 11th, mm -hmm. you sell for less than your 10th, all right? Because the present value of that stream of sales, you're, you're making it smaller by trying to sell too quickly. What you want to do is you want to sort of test and experiment with, well, is market demand rising or not? And if it's rising, I can try and sell a few more, but I'm also going to put the price up. So I've got a paper that sort of explains that logic. And the, you know, and the other thing we don't get in the supply store is unlike bananas, the property rights that you sell when you build are an asset on your balance sheet, even if you don't build them, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas a banana, once you know you've had a good season, you know, it's worth zero to you if you do nothing with it. Whereas the undeveloped land is not worth zero to you because you can always build next year or you can mm -hmm. build the year after or you can build the year after that. And in fact, what's really interesting is that in the New York Times and the Washington Post in the past few months have had articles interviewing property developers and owners of undeveloped massive sites in New York City and all these other major cities who've said, oh, yeah, well, we want to wait for a better time and, you know, undeveloped land's an asset. We don't want to rush in and flood the market. And they've had, for example, seven hectares of vacant land in Manhattan for 20 years that they've been sitting on. And they're just saying, yeah, yeah, well, we, we don't have to 
sell today, we have a timing question that we're trying to optimize mm-hmm. here. So I find it really interesting um, that that we somehow think we can trick people into flooding the market. Yet at the same time, and I'm not sure what the debate's like in Canada, at the same time, many people in Australia say, well, um, yeah, the private market's going to voluntarily build and sell at a lower price. But if you had a public housing provider build houses and sell or rent below the market price, you would need a massive subsidy and it would be inefficient to do that, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So on the one hand, you're saying the thing that the private developer is going to do voluntarily, which is to build so quickly and start reducing prices, Mm -hmm. they will do it voluntarily. But if a public home housing developer were to do it, it would require massive subsidies and be very inefficient. We shouldn't do it. So which is it, guys? Come on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now to, to play to play, I mean, I think all of that makes sense in the context, certainly, of big builders. Now, like to, to play devil's advocate, because we have to do that to keep it interesting. Yeah. The the you know, the Yimby groups, the yes in my backyard kind of groups who are are very pro uh, increasing density and, and all of these things that that mm-hmm. think um, this will lead to uh, a, a surge in new housing. One of the arguments is that by doing that, you take uh, potentially more of your new housing stock now is is in the hands of smaller builders who cannot land bank, right? Uh, Who cannot just sit on property. You're you're gonna rely perhaps more on these small builders who are buying detached homes and now converting them into three row houses, for example. So, Mm -hmm. you know, so I guess my question is, is it, are these policies like are you kind of generally you don't think these policies would work like a lot of the policies here that people are promoting are you know like 60 or 70 percent of toronto you can only have single family detached homes pretty much so you know by up zoning yeah well I, convert that i mean do we potentially see um more housing in some of these neighborhoods and take some of that new construction out of the hands of big builders look so i think the I, I, need, I like to separate the physical shape and design of a city from the economic shape or design of the housing market. And I think that's where the Yimbis um, uh, are missing the, the the economics. I actually agree on a lot of the density uh, incentives um, or changes. Um, so, for example, in Brisbane, we have... Um, pretty broadly allowable townhouses. So you can knock down a house on a big block and build three or four townhouses, or you can put them in the backyard and have a driveway down. So it's quite flexible. And and this kind of soft density is is like reasonably popular. Like people prefer a townhouse to an apartment. They prefer an existing suburb with lots of detached houses. And people who live there don't mind because the street scape doesn't change too much. And it's, you know, it's kind of works really well. And I'm very supportive of it. And, um, you know, I'm supportive of density in general. I think there's a lot of um, underutilized spaces in cities that, you know, should be redeveloped. Um, and, you know, it helps with urban transport as well, right? So in terms of the physical way that I think is efficient for cities to grow, I, I'm on board, okay? Mm-hmm. What I'm not on board with is that this is a housing affordability solution, mm-hmm. okay? So I like to say uh, along the lines of, yeah, I agree with that, that shape and the color and the flavor that you like. Mm-hmm. But if I take a treasury bond that's black and white A4 paper, and I print it on a triangular orange piece of paper, that's a nice shape and it's a nice color. It's still worth exactly the same amount economically, right? Yeah. It's still a treasury bond that's priced based on its future cash flows. And that's true of property always. So one of your, I think what you're getting to with what you're saying about having many small potential builders yeah. is this competition argument. And I hear that quite a lot that... Yeah. Um, you know, the thing, the problem with housing is that it's it's monopolized because we're restricting um, competition with planning laws that we can't have lots of small potential builders. Mm-hmm. Now, if you actually look at the market, that there is no plausible metric by which that's true. So we use metrics like the uh, herfindahl hirschman Index of Industry Concentration, which is um, so in competition policy, you would think about what percentage of 
of the market does the top you know five or three or two uh producers have right so you would look at sort of laptop computers and say well dell apple and samsung you know ha- have uh, the 80 percent of the market between three mm-hmm. three firms if you look at housing construction you know the, the top the top dozen have less than 10 percent of the market anywhere Interesting. Right. So in terms of competition, once you're over three or four firms Mm. in general for the whole market, it's generally pretty competitive. We're talking about a dozen just in 10% of the market. So the remaining 90%, we're talking hundreds and hundreds, Mm -hmm. if not thousands of potential developers. And and the other thing I think is important to keep in mind is people conflate developer and builder Mm -hmm. a lot in these debates. A builder cannot just build homes. Okay. Mm-hmm. A builder is paid by a property owner mm-hmm. to build something on that property. Only property owners can mm-hmm. make decisions about what to build. So when we say we're going to unleash competition, well, yeah, you've you've got maybe you used to have um, 40,000 potential uh, development sites and now you've got 60,000. Okay. How does that change the competition incentive? There is no economic model by which 40,000 is uncompetitive and 60,000 is competitive in a city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and remember, all those extra 20,000 property owners were very were still the property owners when they couldn't develop and get the old income that they got from the property. Mm-hmm. So there is, no, there is no extra incentive for them to rush out and do anything, right? Just as if they'd sold those 20,000 to the other 40,000 existing owners. There would be mm-hmm. all the same incentives all across the board mm-hmm. because those property owners don't have to do anything. They haven't done anything for years. They're, they own the property even though it's only being used for its current use. Mm-hmm. So what you're doing is you're giving them this free financial option, mm-hmm. this free thing and say, hey, not only can you have what you're currently comfortable owning and having, mm-hmm. if some point in the future you want to do something else and make more money, you can have this other valuable property right too. Now, it will change the composition of what gets built where. Of course it will, okay, because some people will make decisions to develop these. And when when buyers go to those new locations, they're not going to go to those old locations, right? And so if we're talking about build to order, then those will get built and the other ones won't. Um, but I, I find the competition argument um, not very persuasive at all. And in fact, indicative of how we've forgotten a lot of what we previously knew about property markets. Mm -hmm. There's a great paper by um, uh, his surname's uh, Glenn Glenn Weil, Glenn Weil, W-E-Y-L. And the title of the paper is called Property is Another Name for Monopoly. And it's basically explaining that it's been well known for hundreds of years that property markets are monopolies and they have these gross inefficiencies uh, and that we can actually improve on the normal market outcome in, in mm-hmm. property. Uh, we know that people are not forced to compete on price in a monopoly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I just feel like it's really bizarre that we've somehow um, <clears throat> directed our policy debate towards the thing that's never worked in the past, that's known to be flawed. Um, and and that's sort of soaked up all the energy from, from any other sort of housing policy. And, you know, if we look historically, it's pre-zoning, property was not cheap, right? In the, in the 1800s, the fact that a whole swathe of society couldn't access property cheap was like the social issue of the day the fact that there were violent violent price cycles and economic cycles because of property markets was the economic problem like um, careers in economics were about why does the capitalist market or the property market why is it so volatile and why why is it not widely shared and why is this there this renter class who can never access it um and and people are like, oh yeah, it's the regulations that did it. Mm-hmm. Haven't really got a good view of history. I mean, the regulations. I mean, zoning in some places was put in place to actually accelerate development to avoid traditional legal remedies of neighbouring property owners who would say, oh no, you can't build houses there because I'm farming and you're next door and that's you know interrupting me. Well, if you have a zoning rule, 
you can say, well, you know, sorry, that remedy is closed to you now. Anyone who wants to do anything that complies with the zone just gets it and you don't have any any recourse. Mm-hmm. So there is some kind of coordination logic to having a planning scheme that um, that arose out of a previous legal logic that was very haphazard. It was one mm-hmm. property owner versus another. So I like to use the example in in um, uh, in medieval England in property. If you had a window that would get the light, the neighbouring property neighbouring property owner couldn't build a house to block the light from your window because mm-hmm. once you had a window, your property right extended all the way to the sun from the mm-hmm. window. <laughs> right and so without zoning you inherit these old-fashioned legal remedies of saying oh i'm sorry you can't do that because you know in my property the you know all the god-given gifts of nature that that come to me to my property are mine um, and you can't interrupt them so you've got to keep that in mind as well so what then is your you know a lot of this supply side argument uh we hear uh, I find is, you know, it's, it's rooted in academic literature, you know, some, some, a lot of academics in the U S who, who like to make this argument that, you know, if you look at certain U S cities that have a relatively relaxed zoning policies that, you know, home prices don't rise there very rapidly in theory, at least at the time of those studies, you know, uh, cities like, <laughs> you know, Phoenix or Charlotte or, or Atlanta or whatever, you know, um, and, and apparently they don't have housing bubbles either because, you know, if, if they can, if supply can adjust to demand, they shouldn't have housing bubbles. So I guess what, <laughs> I'm, 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 look, this, this, this is what I, I yeah, I've heard that. I mean, this is, I mean, this is what I hear all the time, at least from the, the supply advocates that it's this Holy grail, you know, if you reform zoning, then supply could easily keep up with demand. Um, so you're basically, I mean, and from what it sounds like, you obviously are not sort of look. <laughs> look, I think I think we've got to really ask how we judge the credibility of research when facts, uh, you know, research that makes predictions or claims about the world that are subsequently proven wrong. Mm. And so, a lot of those claims about oh, Houston, you know, doesn't have zoning Mm. well houston had the biggest property bubble in the united states in the 1980s firstly and secondly prices have risen more in houston than san francisco in the last decade Mm -hmm. and now we've just forgotten we've just it's just like oh well yeah but i didn't mean that i meant this particular one decade period that i studied and the same applies with the COVID experience Mm -hmm. is all these Oh, the you know, Vancouver and Toronto are expensive because, you know, they're high demand, but they're restricted. But these regional towns, they're cheap because their supply are unrestricted. And COVID just reversed that completely. And all these <laughs> regional unrestricted towns had this massive price bubble. I know in Australia, there's a town called Gladstone in Queensland. And I was looking because I, I, you know, I study the inventory of property developers, their land banks and how many sites they've got that are approved for development. And there was a project there that had 4,000 um, housing lots approved and it only sold one of them. <laughs> and, uh, and it's sitting there and then Gladstone had a bloody housing bubble, right? I'm like, but you had 4,000 approved empty lots owned by a property developer who's apparently in the business of making housing cheap by flooding the market. And and they didn't sell. What they did is they let the price go up and they sold a few because that was optimal for them. And now they own 3,800 at a higher value and they've only sold, you know, 200. So, um, yeah, it's it's really puzzling. And and the one thing that bugs me a lot, that, so in, uh, in the, about a decade ago, there was a, a, a guy from New Zealand, uh, whose claim was that the German planning laws, they were the secret. If only we could take the German planning laws, we wouldn't have a housing bubble because obviously in Germany in the 2000s, houses were still pretty cheap. They didn't have the big bubble. Um, And now there's a bloody housing price explosion in Germany and the people in Berlin want the the government to uh, seize all these housing assets from private landlords to rent them out cheaply. Um, so, you know, that one we can forget about. And then there's the Tokyo story. 
which I find crazy. Like Tokyo had the biggest bubble in the history of the world <laughs> and is renowned for being one of the most expensive places to live in terms of per square meter of dwelling compared to incomes in, in any place in the whole world. And so, yes, it's neat and it's tidy and it's, um, you know, it's got the Japanese style, but if you're paying, you know, someone said, oh, look, wouldn't it be great if we had these nine square meters, um, what's nine square meters, 90 square feet um, apartments like they have in Tokyo, wouldn't that make housing cheap? And I'm just thinking that's not cheap. Like <laughs> you can make a pizza cheaper by just buying one slice, but that doesn't make pizza cheaper. Okay. And if you think not having 90 square meters per person is cheap, then, you know, America has um, like five to 10 times that much space per person. You can have five to 10 times the population, not build a single extra dwelling and still have more space than Tokyo. Yeah. And that's, you're saying that's somehow a better outcome than what you have right now. And it blows <laughs> my mind. It really blows my mind because in Australia, I think the number is three. So typical Australian city, people have three times much as more indoor space in their dwelling than anyone in Tokyo. Plus the backyards in Australia, you know, are, are massive. And everyone says, oh, we should adopt their planning. I'm like, well, if you want to have uh, three times as many people live in your house, mm -hmm. right? If that's the outcome you want, <laughs> then I, I don't know what to say because that's what they have in Tokyo. And yeah, the fact that they have um some neat little you know capsules or whatever instead of a wall divider or something um doesn't really change it like you're just now losing your mind by comparing dwellings rather than space like i don't know how that works so yeah it, it's a bizarre um it's a bizarre world we live in and we also have a lot in the in the u.s and i've written about this the ucla group um the Lewis Center, I think it's called, their research group at the UCLA. And they're funded by this great big land banking developer who, uh, sorry, to talk about, you know, the stories that have been disproved, you've got to um, have your wits about you a little bit as well of who's mm -hmm. telling you these stories. Uh, a group that's funded by a company that um, has a land bank of 50,000 detached houses and and uh, 16,000 apartment sites or uh, mm -hmm. sites that they can build 16,000 apartments on who isn't in the business of building and who tells the New York times that the market's turned. So we're going to have to stop building. <laughs> like you've got to ask yourself, um, you know, how serious anyone really is about the stories they're telling. Is this just a political game that we like to play? Is it just like entertainment or are we, we really serious that this is a genuine argument? We want to deal with the evidence. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you raise a great point. I mean, the when you when you look at, I, I mean, the point you made very early on about when you look at some of this research and the data after it was published kind of disproves the original point is one I found interesting. Mm. Like especially, specifically a lot of these papers about these you know, what they call elastic housing markets or elastic supply. I mean, the hmm. Atlantas, the, the, you know, uh, a lot of Texas, Charlotte, like all Phoenix, like prices have exploded there. Like you said, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not experts in those markets. I think probably I wonder how much of that is the fact that these big Wall Street firms are, are basically kind of buying up a lot of the stock. I mean, to some extent, that might be part of it. But at the end of the day, prices are still surging. So this idea that um, simply having uh, relaxed zoning policies will prevent any growth in house prices seems a little naive, I think. Yeah, and look, uh, and in, to get a bit technical again, uh, I, I agree with all that. I actually think the concept of supply elasticity is also a bit incoherent itself because it, it implies that um, price levels are the determinant of the speed at which housing is built. But if you had a particular price level, imagine you have a town mm -hmm. with a fixed number of people and a fixed number of dwellings and a set price, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you'd get no new buildings, right? Because mm -hmm. everyone lives somewhere. The price is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yet the elasticity somewhat implies that, well, at that price level, there is some kind of rate of supply that people would just keep building at. I'm like, but there isn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd be in an equilibrium because you would have 10 households living in 10 houses yeah. paying a set price and the equilibrium rate of supply would be zero, mm -hmm. right? So actually what 
what the housing market responds to is not demand or the price in terms of levels, but in terms of the change. Mm-hmm. Only when there's a change in that do we get a response. And and again, in, the, in my paper where I talk about the optimal rate of supply, it shows that you don't supply unless there's a change in demand if mm-hmm. you're in that fixed situation. So the whole idea of this elasticity um, that, that the rate of new housing supply is depending on the level of mm-hmm. price, I think is conceptually flawed as well. And yet there's, there's not a lot of... Um, uh, you know, reflection on this idea. It's just, you know, it's almost just thrown around conveniently mm-hmm. uh, for a political agenda. And and the weird thing is I agree on a lot of the upzoning stuff and I agree that there's a lot of planning rules that don't make sense anymore. So I find myself torn a lot by saying, yeah, okay, this is it's probably a good idea to do that. But you're now overstepping the mark by saying, oh, we've really got to upzone to this or prices will be expensive. I'm like, no, that's not true. <laughs> but yeah, it's probably a good area to densify because it's got good existing infrastructure. It's well connected and there's, you know, um, there, there's plenty of physical space between the current dwellings for some soft density. Like I, I, I agree with all that part. Um, but yeah, this whole, um, it, it just gets a bit out of hand at times. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, we're approaching kind of the end of our chat and I thought we'd, we'd wrap up with kind of going off on a slightly different topic and kind of getting your thoughts because I heard your podcast where you talked about uh, the housing market in uh, Singapore and I thought that was really interesting. I mean, I think, you know, for people who are concerned about these issues, I think it's important to see what other countries are doing. I mean, even if we can't completely change easily, but it's interesting to see what they've done. So I don't know if you can kind of unpack um, you know, some of the, some of the things that you've seen in their housing market. Yeah. So what I like to say to people is if you, uh, you know, the, the problem of housing is unequal access. Some people own it and some people don't. And those that own it want the price to go up. All right. That's two thirds of people. Uh, the 18% of households are landlords in Australia and they're the wealthiest and they want rents and prices to go up. So what you have is this real sort of economic tension uh, between the economic interests of the providers and the the economic interests of the non non owners, and and I like to use the example of healthcare uh, because we know in the US there's a debate about healthcare and we go well there's unequal access to healthcare if I don't you know if I'm not the, an insider with good insurance and I don't have access did we say oh we need more supply we need to unleash the private hospital market on these people no we didn't we said actually yeah, you're right. We need a new system for delivering healthcare. And so in Australia, we have a public hospital system and anybody can show up at the public hospital system. And we have a private hospital system and and everybody loves it and everyone thinks it's fair and everyone thinks it's a great solution to unequal access to healthcare. Yet in housing, we don't think that anymore, even though we did in the past. In fact, in the, after the Second World War, we were building 15% of new dwellings were public housing of some form and they were sold often to tenants at a discounted price. So Singapore basically takes the logic of healthcare and welfare to their property market and says everyone who's a Singapore citizen or permanent resident uh, has the right to buy a dwelling at a discounted price from the public housing developer, just like anybody has the right to show up at a public hospital. And you can use your compulsory retirement savings to do that because we also think a house is the best asset to own in retirement. So for your typical young Singapore citizen, so let me give you an example of someone I interviewed there. They paid about 300,000 Singaporean dollars, which is not too different from an Aussie dollar or a Canadian dollar for a new apartment from their public housing developer. It took two years between getting committed off the plan and having construction finished. And in a private market, and the private market's predominantly foreign owners, that same dwelling would be about a million dollars. So wow. they're getting a $300,000 apartment, a million dollar apartment, $300,000 and using their compulsory retirement savings to do it. And in fact, they had zero out of pocket costs to buy that because their retirement savings paid the deposit and all the mortgage. Mm-hmm. And they said to me, that's very common. That's what we all expect. That's our right as citizens to do that. And so in Singapore, they took home ownership from 20% in the 1960s to 88% today 
mm-hmm. because they said everybody who doesn't own a home we will give you the right to buy one at a discount uh, from the public housing provider and a massive discount they also used to provide discounted mortgages um, and it's heavily integrated into their welfare system mm-hmm. and and so i've proposed australia could copy that um and it wouldn't even have to be such a big scale because remember already two thirds of people own their own home they're, mm. they're satisfied in the private market there's a bunch of people who will want to you know rent privately in very fancy houses or whatever and in australia it's only about a hundred thousand people per year who become first home buyers so we only need to satisfy some portion of one hundred thousand people per year um with a, t- a, a different option um and so i've proposed we copy singapore's system in australia and i've called my proposal housemate mm-hmm. and i said we just need a large-scale public housing developer to just go and do what the planning system says we want in different cities mm-hmm. apartments in the inner city townhouses in the suburbs detached houses in the in the fringes and in the regional towns and just offer them for sale for qualifying residents who don't already own property mm-hmm. and give them a discounted price and what they do is when it's oversubscribed, you, you know, get your name in a lottery. And if you actually miss out on one project and you've put your name in, you get twice as many chances in the next one. So it's a very fair um, system. And what it would do in Australia and probably in Canada is by creating that alternative option for renters and first home buyers, it will reduce their willingness to pay for the private rental market. Because mm-hmm. if you have to pay... Two and a half thousand dollars a month to rent in the private market, or you can buy from the housing developer for fifteen hundred a month, mm-hmm. right? You're not going to just pay all that extra rent. You're going to switch off, and that pressure at yeah. the margin will keep a lid on private rents. Just like competition keeps a lid on prices, mm-hmm. you're essentially adding a, a, a competitor alternative to the private property market. And so, in Singapore, you own these dwellings. They're on ninety-nine year leases, but the people I've interviewed at the housing development board said, no one's going to get kicked out of their house after 99 years Mm. in Australia. We have 99 year land titles in the ACT where Canberra, the capital is. Mm. And after, you know, so in 1910 or 1911 were the first leases after 99 years, they said, well, we're not going to kick people out. If you pay us $260, we'll give you another 99 years. Right. So it's not, you know, people get obsessed with its leasehold in Singapore. You don't really own it. I'm like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, So, so that's what I sort of propose. Like we do it for public parks and no one calls it middle-class welfare when we build a public park or Mm -hmm. a rich suburb has a public park, Mm -hmm. even though they could buy backyards. Right. But we get obsessed when it comes Mm -hmm. to housing. We don't call it middle-class welfare when we have public hospitals, but we call it that when we have housing. And I think the beauty of Singapore is that anybody from any economic background, it's not just for the poorest of the poor, it's for anybody. So you can actually buy a five-bedroom condo, like very fancy apartment in the public housing scheme if you want. The the point being that it's about a third of the market price. I mean, to me, that's super interesting because I, I mean, I've, I've certainly heard of obviously, uh, you know, governments involved in, in, in housing and, and sort of nonprofit models or, or government models but that, that, are, that are more geared towards rentals. I have never heard of a model uh, that, is, that is sort of nonprofit kind of government led uh, to be, uh, you know, owner occupied. And I think there's a couple of things that are important. I think you mentioned in your podcast that the people buying it have to be first time, like they can't own other real estate, correct? Correct, correct. So yeah. you have to be a citizen or permanent resident and you can't own any other real estate in Singapore. And then when when you want to sell it, you can only mm-hmm. yeah. sell it to another, for, so it's, it's another first time buyer who is a resident or uh, or something like that. So it's almost like this, these yeah, yeah. homes have a different market from the sort correct. of the private sector, right? Yeah, you create this parallel market of residents who don't own other property who have yeah. to live in the houses they build. And so, yes, so you buy this place from the Housing Development Board. You, there's a, the MOP, the mandatory occupation period is five years. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to live there. You can't sublet it or anything. And after five years, you do whatever you want. But when you sell it, you have to sell to another qualifying buyer, right? And that's what keeps a lid on the secondary market for these homes because every qualifying buyer has the option to buy the brand new one at the discounted price. (laughs) Now, people still get, 
upset because the secondhand HDB houses are going up in value because the older projects are now in really nice established areas, right? Mm-hmm. Where the new projects are sort of in these new suburbs and it's not quite yeah. as cool or trendy or close to as many uh, workplaces. So they, the secondhand ones are going up in price, but you can still use your retirement savings for that. And it's still your choice. Mm. right so it's it's a better option and i and let me be clear people still complain in singapore when the price of, but but they complain differently because when the hdb houses uh i think a couple of years ago there was a second hand apartment in an hdb dwelling that sold for a million dollars and everyone panicked and like oh my god we've got to do something um and actually you know singapore the the attitude is very different when everyone has the right to this they're very protective of the system um and it's politically um, beneficial to invest more in HDB and do better dwellings next next project, make them bigger and better, which I find amazing. So I'll get, let me give you an example. I was meeting uh, representatives from Singapore in Sydney, and we were in this like laneway cafe, and it was started raining, and the building across the alleyway from us had this pipe just dumping water into the middle of the lane where people it's like a pedestrian thoroughfare mm. and they we thought oh gee that's not good and they said if that happened in singapore well for starters it wouldn't happen but if it happened and that was an hdb building the whole community would be like oh that's unacceptable and it would be politically expedient to go and fix it the following day to get the good press about it because everyone is so like um you know, it's such a big part of the culture and it's such a big part of the, you know, they're proud of HDB and they're like, have high expectations for it. So yeah. HDB is the housing development board, the public developer. They said, people don't stand for that. Like they expect this and they get it. And and it's a completely different um, sort of culture to where we go, oh, private, private, you know, the private building owner, you know, we can't impose an extra cost on them to fix their downpipes and their, their drainage. Like... <laughs> You know, it's it's completely bizarre, and and yet we have that with public schools. Everyone's very proud of public schools, and when there's a new public school building, everyone's very happy, and we don't call that middle class welfare either. <laughs> and yet with housing, we we've sort of talked ourselves into this. Oh, there's no, you know, put our hands up. There's nothing we can do except up zone, um, which of course only benefits the people who already own all the property that's being up zoned. <laughs> that's very right? true. It's yeah. it's only. Hey, it's only if you, uh, if that logic of this is bringing down prices, which yeah. I don't think it really does in the aggregate, mm-hmm. um, it's only that secondary effect that may or may not happen that might benefit others. So I think you've got to be exactly. wary as well. Awesome. Well, that's super interesting. And thanks again for your time today. It was a great, uh, great chat. I learned a lot. And uh, I think hopefully our uh, listeners and viewers also. Thanks again, Cameron, for taking the time today. No, it was great to chat, John. Thanks for having me.